Um, so those three organizations being City Bureau, um, which has a another event going on tonight over at the South Shore Cultural Center, which um, super excited for, for that going on. Uh, and basically, they are a civic media uh, lab, if you will. They have public newsrooms every Thursday in the coffee shop, as well as uh, fellowships that, are, that happen seasonally. Um, outside of that, Southside Weekly, which uh, I don't know if, if y'all are familiar with the weekly, but print-based print uh, newspaper that uh, comes out uh, throughout the summer. It's been a little bit off, but uh, as of now, we'll be coming out on a weekly basis. Um, and Invisible Institute, which focuses on mainly police research. Um, and then also big shout out to uh, Bill Coffee, which is a, is a new addition to the building, but super huge and super grounding, I feel like, for uh, so many of these peoples and initiatives and places to kind of meet. So um, yeah, that's the Experimental Station. And at, at some point, I think Matthew, maybe as me and Patrick uh, kind of kind of close our conversation, would, would love to show people the building and talk more about it. So um, thank you to everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you for sliding. Super happy to, to have this um, and have y'all out, especially when there's so many other things going on. I also heard Eve Ewing is like doing a book release at the CTU building and there's a bunch of, there's like, a, yeah, I don't know, a bunch of other things you could be doing. So thank y'all for coming out and, and, and right, right, exactly. So thank y'all for coming out and kicking it with us. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe brief introduction um, and or framing why we're even having a conversation maybe in the first place. Um, my name is Kahari and uh, I'm, a, I'm a native Chicago and native Southsider. Uh, I work in this building um, through a lot of the organizations, but particularly with the journalism orgs right now. I came through Blackstone, that's originally how I found this place um, and went on to find my way into doing a little bit of journalism and now uh, am a multimedia maker and an artist in a lot of ways. Uh, I make drawings, I shoot photos, make videos, um, and all trying to do that with the storytelling or journalistic lens. Um, so yeah, what's up Patrick, how you doing? Okay, you want me to introduce myself? <laughs> okay. <I'm... laughs> all right, my name is Patrick McCoy and I'm also a lifelong resident of the neighborhood of Woodlawn. In fact, I was born on 63rd Street down on, six, on 62nd and 63rd and Champlain. So I've been in this neighborhood all of my life. Uh, and I am familiar with this particular area because the streetcar used to turn right here. And right where this is and on the other side of the steam plant was an artist colony. Uh, that uh, came to in existence and was thriving uh, from the, the 50s and the 60s and so forth. All right, I grew up on the South Side and went to Inglewood High School, left there and went on to the University of Chicago and majored in chemistry. Though my love was always art because I have a, a father who was a painter, frustrated, and a mother who was very, very artistic. So I grew up in a very artistic environment, but I fell in love with chemistry and went on and got a degree in chemistry. And then, uh, that was like in 1969, the world changed. The world changed uh, with the assassination of Martin Luther King. All of a sudden, we now have a whole black, black power movement. We've moved away from the civil rights movement. Uh, there's a whole black arts concept. and the neighborhoods changed. Woodlawn was affected greatly by the, uh, the, the rebellion that occurred right after uh, King's uh, assassination. And I was right there in the midst of it. So I saw how this neighborhood has changed. I then changed my career because all of a sudden in the environmental uh, uh, field of study, environmentalism, became a really, really important subject. It did not exist as a course of study when I was at the University of Chicago. So I had to end up going to another university, Governor State, which had started a very uh, experimental and very d dynamic environmental science program. So at, in that program, I got so uh, connected to the in 
EPA because I was doing uh, graduate work on Lake Michigan. We were studying air pollution on Lake Michigan and we had to go out on the ship. And through those connections, I got a job at the EPA. And I went on and worked there for 30 years. Now, I grew up in this neighborhood and what I can talk to about later is how it has changed. I'm an avid cyclist, but when I was coming up, bicycles were for toys. Nobody, nobody past 12 years old rode a bike. You know, that was just like, there was no, you just didn't do that. And uh, so that's, that's one of the major changes because it, it reflects that we are now, as adults, using it are thinking about something that we did not think about in, uh, uh, at that time. And I think you want to ask me some questions about environmentalism and com community uh, in the front. But I'm 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 going to cut you off right okay. there. Okay. Because uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> there's a, there's, there's, I got a joke that is Patrick wouldn't have got up here if it wasn't for thinking that he could also center me in this conversation. That's correct. I want y'all to know that uh, I am a, a big, big fan of uh, Patrick, uh, have been for a while, and was, was super excited that Alpha Bruden thought about me um, in relation to uh, interviewing Patrick. Um, immediately as I started posting my Instagram and was doing other things, people were like, oh my God, you're about to interview Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Patrick. I've been to Patrick's house. I've seen all that art on his walls. Like, and so, I mean, from, from a real place, um, Patrick is a extremely, extremely special person um, to so many people in Chicago and in so many worlds, obviously, right? You know, we're, we're here tonight to talk about intersections between environmentalism, community, art. Of course, we're going to talk about bikes because we both love bikes a lot. Um, but uh, do know that I'm sitting next to one of the most humble uh, people who has been in service to so many people for so long and, Thank you. Thank and uh, you know, probably wouldn't up that or champion that. So uh, that's something I would love to uplift and, and just say, you know, you are super loved, super, uh, super, yeah, respected. And, and I think a lot of uh, my questions, yeah, of course, are going to stem from just wanting to know more about you, just being, you know, genuinely okay. curious. So uh, I think one thing I would probably throw at you first okay. is uh, you are from the South Side of Chicago and that's you went correct. to U Chicago in... The later 1960s? Well, I, um, I entered there in, uh, in October of 1964. So I, I came in there in the mid-1960s and left in 69. Now, that's huge. Um, yes, even, even being from the South Side now, I have only known two Native South Siders and or black people that have even went to that institution uh, at all. And you not only graduated from there and then went on to continue your education in another place. What was it like going to... U of C or a PWI at that time, period? Or like the politics or how, how big of an accomplishment did you see it as at the time? Maybe you didn't. I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't think of it that much. In fact, the reason I came there was not because of some academic thing at all. Uh, my girlfriend in high school, she wanted to come to the University of Chicago and I didn't really care. And so I said, I'll go where you go. <laughs> and I got in and she barely got in and she left. And I ended up staying. So I wasn't thinking like that. You know how people do it today, that like, oh, I got to get a U of C. So uh, I see it now and didn't really understand at the time just what, uh, what type of institution it was. I, I appreciated it and got an exceptionally good education out of it. Uh, but I have my issues. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so while there you're studying chemistry, um, is there a time period in between when you're leaving undergrad and you're going to f go do that master's that is then f focused on environmentalism or was that straight was no, that back no, to back? No, no, that no, that's also a fluke. That was a total fluke. Um, I left the University of Chicago and it has the ability to make you feel like you are very, very stupid because it is, it is so rigorous in its, in its course of study that what would be an A student almost anywhere in the country, you're barely getting a C. And so you end up coming out of there almost deflated, totally 
just the big head with, the, with information, but you are deflated in the sense of that, oh, I was the valedictorian when I came out of high school. Now I barely got a C average at the U of C. Uh, so I wasn't really geeked up to go into actual chemistry, which is what I got my degree in, and accepted a position to go and teach high school chemistry. I went back to the school that I graduated from, Inglewood, and taught for two years uh, high school chemistry and physics, and that was an eye-opener. One, for anybody that has never done it, you really ought to spend some period of your life teaching, is that when you teach, you learn. You learn better than you did when you sat in the class. Is that all of a sudden I was un understanding what I was being taught in the class was at U of C. I could see it clearly because I'm now having to translate it and put it into these young people's heads. So I did that for two years, and then with the great blessings of the CPS, uh, they laid me off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they just do some crazy thing. I was, I was really uh, gung-ho. I would have stayed as an instructor, a teacher forever if they hadn't laid me off. So I didn't have a job. And this is 1971. Now, I had read Silent Spring, which was the book that basically triggered the whole environmental movement. And also, I lived on the south side so I could see the pollution that was, in, was serious. In fact, Pollution and environmental issues were right in our face to the point that you were irritated by it, uh, which is different from today. So I had a sense of the environmental concept, but uh, I didn't have any educational con uh, structure for it. So I'm out of a job, and I, I go to an employment agency, and they said, oh, we have a job in Gary, Indiana, for the chief chemist of the air pollution division. And I said, I don't know anything about air pollution. And he said, you came from the U of C, you can do it. And so I went, I went and took this job and started to function in this laboratory and office, because Gary had basically the worst air pollution problem in the whole country at the time. So I was just thrown into the environmental field uh, head first into this and really found out just how fascinating it was because it was an intersectional kind of a concept that you used a lot of different parts of your brain. Is that Yes, I needed to know my science and so forth, but then you had to study biology, you had to understand social issues, you had to understand the law and so forth. So all of that started to come together and it kind of fit my personality because I was not after graduating, I realized I couldn't work in a lab. That was not just not who I was. So I, I ended up getting into this field on a fluke. And for three years, I really was um, fascinated to the point that I decided to go and get a master's degree in that. Awesome. Uh, plain and short, for those who may not know, um, I don't think I would have been hip if it wasn't for my little sister in the back and Tony back there. But what is environmentalism? How do you how do you describe that? How do you talk about it? Like, well, it's it's a concern for the the, the world around you. As that we went into the mid uh, 20th century with a concept that uh, uh, the economy you can just do anything. Nobody was concerned about waste, what, you know, that here you have these major uh, factories and so forth, and they're just spewing out stuff, but that meant jobs. And so people weren't thinking about it. Now, in the early 60s, we now started to have, in the air, air pollution area, some episodes that were really dramatic and caught the attention of the country. Is that in uh, Pennsylvania, they had uh, a... Uh, stagnation of the air to the point where people were dying from the, from the, the emissions from the, the steel mills in those uh, valleys because the air couldn't get out and they, people were just breathing this really toxic stuff. New York City had the same sort of thing. Los Angeles, you couldn't see in Los Angeles small. So people had a real gritty, intimate experience with these problems. People living in Northwest Indiana, Gary and so forth, uh, there were people that c 
could not put their clothes out on the line because they end up be dirt, dirtier after they washed them than, than before. Uh, people would be uh, essentially, because I've read all of these reports, people would have to hide in their house in the basement and tape the windows and so forth because they lived next to a plant that was just spewing stuff down on them. So it was a very, very intimate, in-your-face kind of issue to the point we now celebrate Earth Day on April 22nd. It's to the point that 100,000 people came and went and sat in Washington, D.C. in front of Nixon and said, you've got to do something about that. Now, Nixon, of course, hated all of that stuff and the environmental stuff. But the one thing I have to give him, he was a master politician. And he recognized that 100,000 people standing out in front of his house, he needed to get in front of it. And so all of a sudden, they passed really really strong laws, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and so forth. All that, Nixon put that in play because he recognized that was too many people at his doorstep. <laughs> and we need to do that again, is that they think that they, they're not being put under any pressure today. Uh, that's a side. Yeah, that was one of the things <laughs> that uh, I think in, in talking to you and uh, being able to hang out with you, I learned that there was a lot of like movement work and people on the ground like pushing a lot of these things forward. Um, and then you, as a scientist, or as you, someone that maybe has to push people on policies or push corporations or people that were making a lot of money but not necessarily caring for the world or the environment, um, what, what were some of those specific things that you kind of remember as being really, really harmful to the environment? Maybe uh, from the from the the corporate level, we, but then also we don't have enough time. Okay. We don't have Understood. enough time. <laughs> but I do want to to, to qualify a, a couple of things. Is that one is that these the corporations are not necessarily anti environment. They are pro money, and they only do what they have to do. So if you don't push them, they don't do it. Even though they know. They know better. They might even have the best people working for them on the issue that you're presenting. But they will say, I don't need to, ha I don't have, legally, I don't have to do this, so I'm not going to do it. And a lot of the things that I found uh, working with the EPA was that these corporations that are across the country, they have places all over the country, and the environmental agencies that have to enforce the law are at the state and local level. And the state and local level, people can get bought off real easy. To the point, I can give you one example, uh, up in Wisconsin, which is a, beside being the dairy state, is a state that is big on paper making because they got all these trees. And the paper mills were notorious. And they, and they had some that would spew out sulfur dioxide out to the point where everything, sulfur dioxide, when it comes in contact with water, becomes sulfuric acid. <laughs> <laughs> so this is stuff that is coming out every two hours in this little town of Rochester, Wisconsin. They had to go up there. And it was, the, the, the plant was down on the river at Valley, and there was a bluff that went up and there's a grammar school right at the top of the bluff, and the, the stack of the plant was right at the same level as the, as the thing. So every two hours, this sulfur dioxide gas, highly concentrated, would spew over on the school. All right, the kids did not want to go out to recess. That's how bad it was. They did not want to go outside. They didn't want to drink the milk in the cartons. Remember the little cartons of milk? They didn't want to drink it. Now, this is the dairy state, so you know if anybody got some fresh milk, it's in, it's in Wisconsin. Mm. So I went in and, explore, and researched it and found out what it was that at this concentration of sulfur dioxide in the air, you can taste it. I mean, this is way past the point you're not supposed to be in the room, but you, <laughs> you can taste sulfur dioxide, it makes everything sour. So these kids were experiencing this, this poisonous gas when they drank the milk. So this company was saying, when we went to bring them to, besides the fact that the local agency uh, guy, 
he was upset that we came in because I'm coming as a federal person. He's upset because as soon as I get there, I said, what is the heck is that smell? He said, smells like money to me. I'm like, whoa. Mm. <laughs> but this company, we brought them to the table. We're going to enforce that. It's a warehouse. I don't have no problem telling you. Uh, we brought them to the table, and they were swearing up and down they did not know how to solve this problem. Okay? We're in Wisconsin. I happen to have a friend that worked for the agency in Washington State. And Washington State, like Wisconsin, has a whole lot of trees. And they also had paper mills. And they had been enforcing for 15 years regulations that actually kept these emissions from ha warehouses has a plant over there. So the president of, I mean, the vice president of the company is in, sitting in the meeting and saying to me, we don't know how to solve that problem. I said, that's interesting because in your plant in Washington, you have been doing this for 15 years. Why can't you do it in Wisconsin? So it's only when they are forced to do something, do they do it? They know how to solve these problems. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I mean, that, that, that's wild, especially in a climate in which uh, I feel like we are even further being told not to care about it, and a lot of that stuff is disappearing. I mean, I, I imagine, I remember around election time uh, getting a bunch of uh, messages or seeing in my timelines that a lot of the things around environmentalism and climate change and all those things were disappearing from, you know, and people losing funding to do that type of oh, work. Yeah. And uh, how, do you how do you think that is now? And do you think the state of that is, is getting even worse Almost in a certainly. lot of ways? Well, it's, it's worse. Number one, I, I, I want to preface that we, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the environmental issues were in your face the Cuyahoga River catching on fire and so forth, is that you saw it. Now, we spent 20, 30 years cleaning up a lot of those things. So those extreme examples where if you even look over towards Gary, it does not look the way it used to. It's not, it's, it, you know, remember, I need the old heads, remember the flames would just shoot up and light up the sky from the, the steel mills and the refineries. That was 24-7 it was going on. No, we don't say that anymore. We worked it. I, in fact, I got that activity of them flames going up. I got that stopped. Um, so we don't see that. And so you end up kind of getting kind of comfortable with that. The problems are not that bad. It's not this. Most of the stuff is invisible now. And that it is part of your daily life that we have now are damaging the, the environment. And we are su being sufficiently devious in that we dump it somewhere else and you don't get to see it. So we're, the problem is worse today because we didn't have all these things. People didn't have the ability to go to the Home Depot and get a big container of Roundup and spray this unbelievable strong poison everywhere. And, and, and kill everything. Like, for those, the old heads, remember the concept of the night crawlers, the little worms? That, every night, you, the street sidewalks would be filled with these worms. You don't see them anymore. You don't see them even after a rain. You don't see the grasshoppers that used to come in droves in Chicago. The midway would be just filled, just like locusts, filled with grasshoppers. You don't see that anymore. And in fact, there was an article two days ago uh, where the scientists reported of the massive die-off of insects all over the world. That's going to be catastrophic. Um, so, but you, the, the issue is that we now have an administration that is saying it's not happening, where all, the rest of the world is already on that page. We led. The, the, the charge to get the rest of the world to where they are, and now we've backed 180 degrees. We turned around and gone back. Do you think that we as individuals also have any role and responsibility in terms of, you saying, like adding to it and or being a solution to a lot of these problems? We, like, is your love for cycling, for example, connected to any environmentalist cause oh. or, or you trying to uh, 
have a plant-based diet, right? Connected to you thinking that that's a solution to environmentalism. Uh, I have a mixed feeling about that. Is that what I saw, let's, I'm taking an example of Chicago. Chicago was a dirty city when I, in the 60s. I mean, it was really filthy. And in and, and, and every neighborhood uh, in the 1960s. And that was because everybody's house was heated with coal. Everybody, the coal trucks would go up the alleys, they'd fill up their bins and so forth. Everybody's house was heated with coal, all the buildings and so forth. All right? And so all of us, every one of us was contributing to the problem of the, the extreme pollution in Chicago. Now, without any one of us making any decision to correct that problem, we did that. Guess what happened? Natural gas came in, and it was cheaper than coal. Everybody switched. All of a sudden, when you only, Chicago, when I was a kid, would be guaranteed like somewhere between 10 and 13 days of blue sky, all of a sudden the sky is clear. We all made a small decision that had a dramatic effect, and we didn't do it for environmental purposes. The same could be done with all these other things, is that they could slip this in so that you make the decision based on something else, and it has a significant, in total, environmental impact. I don't think that we can do it with this, the concept, look, I do ride a bike, uh, but I don't think I could convince, because it's hard to even convince a handful of my friends to do that uh, enough to make a difference. But something else could. All of a sudden, you uh, have a decision where uh, you have a massive increase of public, uh, public transportation that incorporates bicycles, eliminate, pushes back cars, all of a sudden, and cheap, we make those decisions. And all of a sudden, it's get, it gets better. But I don't think that we can each individually make a decision that in the, the, in the total would have an effect. Because you know, as long as I have the ability to use some plastic device uh, to get something to eat in a plastic container, I'm going to do that. I mean, I'm not going to, we just don't go out of our way to do that. But now if they make it so that you can't do that, because this other thing is so much better, then yeah, we'll, we'll give it up. Understood. Um, I want to open it up while on the topic of environmentalism, because I'm going to make the hard switch <laughs> to the other part that Patrick has been doing this entire time, uh, which is art. So okay. before doing that, um, maybe open it up to see. You wanna? You got a question? Yeah. Um, this might be blasphemy, but uh, oh. hi. I was listening to NPR, and I heard an expert come on talking about, and he he'd been involved. He's an environmentalist and been involved with the environment for a long time, and he was talking about how recycling, all these recycling plants and stuff actually is less efficient and harder on the environment than just like picking it all up in a truck and taking it to a landfill and burying it. And so it's really stuck with me. And so now every time, literally every time, I recycle something, <laughs> something I'm thinking, Do, is this really necessary? Um, I would say yes. I think it's, it's, it's a noble and I think the problem is that we just don't do it well. Is that, uh, and the products are made such that they're really sloppy for the, pro the, the act of now recycling it. And that there aren't uh, the forces put on you. Like every time I go to New York City, I see in a city of eight million people they have four or five different bins in their house. Okay, there's the brown garbage, there's this, this, and so forth. It, you can force people to do these things, and they will follow suit and do it. But if you make it difficult, like in Chicago, it's very difficult. All of a sudden, they don't want bottles that have some juice in it and so forth. And, it, and that makes the recycling activity difficult. Yeah. Yep. It's like a design problem. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. I was just going to say that I would, I think that um, 
I guess I'm like a millennial or whatever, but I do think our generation has really pushed companies to think about how they're making um, objects. And I think companies have had to embrace more like social um, equity. I, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but more like um, social concerns and um, being able to sell products. So I'm thinking about fast fashion and, you know, like H&M thinking about, okay, how can we incorporate other materials? so that um, the environment isn't being harmed as much. I don't know if it's effective or not, but I, that just comes to mind. But I'm guessing like on a more micro level, how can like communities um, kind, of, um, uh, kind of like fight back against like de facto or de facto environmental issues and specifically how can African-American communities do it? So I know mm -hmm. like lead poisoning or whatever in water with CPS was a big issue last year, but I'm mm. kind of unsure with how to change that when we know like our public school system is funded by like uh, you know property taxes, and if you have neighborhoods where there are a bunch of lots or rundown properties, how do you? You've answered the question. Okay. It's political. Okay. It's very political, and I, I started out saying Nixon, who hated the environment, did not want to do it, was in the pocket of industry, got in front of the environmental issue because the people demanded it. And he f marshaled through Congress serious laws. In fact, I memorized this stuff because I, when, we, we started, when I started reading and understanding what they actually in Congress wrote and gave so much power to the people. And that's what they're destroying right now. They know it. If, they, if, if these laws keep, if they can, you know, the acts have to be reauthorized re every 10 years. So they know if you keep this on the bo books, the judges and all of can't get around it. It's written so clear. So that's what I'm saying, politics. You got to get people in there, take them, the folks that are, are champion this deregulation, get them out of there. Because that's the only way. You got to have to have people that are responding to your concerns. So, the, um, so are you suggesting that the main way to resolve the matter is by voting? Is there any other? Yeah, it's revolution. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, you got a question? Yeah, it's it, it's uh, it, it's the the people moving. People moving. Uh, they responded to it then, they could, they'll respond to it again. And in fact, some people need to be drugged down the street. <laughs> hey, Patrick, I adore you, Thank as you, you know. I am a big, big fan. Um, so I'm, it's hard to know what to do, because we're, we're hearing so many, even in this conversation, there's been contradiction in the idea that we as individuals can't do enough. Um, we're expecting a government that is not listening mm -hmm. um, to make decisions that are not pro-capitalism. Um, and we know that that's the driver for what's going on on the planet. And yet, um, I teach, as you know, young people. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I really think is the most critical thing is to teach consumption because I believe that's the biggest form of divestment that we could be doing because I know, yeah, plastic containers are convenient, but it's also convenient because a lot of us don't know the damage that they're doing. Mm -hmm. So my thought is get them young so that they consume differently and that is the revolutionary divestment that I'm hoping um, will make a difference. It certainly made a difference in my home as far as like mm -hmm. what I buy, where I buy it, why do I buy it? Right. Um, Once you... So, oh, okay. So my question, from your um, chemist EPA background, I heard you say Roundup. What would you say is the biggest um, form of divestment that we could... What is the biggest, most radical divestment when it comes to chemical toxin on the planet? What is the thing that we as consumers can have the most awareness around you know, we know about Roundup, we know GMO, we know like all of the things that we're not supposed to be doing, but what would you say is the most like, if everybody in this room today were to no, stop purchasing yeah, that, one you're, thing. You're creating a false, you're, you're okay. creating a false narrative. Okay, help like, me. 
is that there isn't, there's never any one thing. And we have, to, and, and anybody that is like you, aware, you clearly are going to change your behavior. Mm -hmm. But most people aren't. And most people are just like any other organism, it will consume. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's there, they will, they will keep consuming it. So you have to actually do something to create a situation where it's not there, or it's there in a different form. It just, uh, the concept that people will wake up and, and do the right thing, I'm past that. Uh, and that is there's- Is it an and, or is it an or? Meaning like, can we policy and consume less? Oh, yeah. Or is it, it, does it have to be like, I'm at a point where I don't expect our government to do anything, so it's. And I'm saying that's a bad thought. Okay. Is that I'm expecting that the government that I would like to push forward will respond to me. Mm -hmm. So I know this one won't. And in the and, meantime? There is no in meantime. We have to do it now. <laughs> That's the concept that I, that I feel was uh, important back in, in the, the 60s, is that people uh, actually felt really compelled to go and, and stand up and say, I'm not, I'm not going with this. This is not acceptable. Well, you also made one distinction that um, Hyde Park, right, as a place and as a demographic, um, of people were always able to push a lot of things further, much quicker than, for example, a group of poor black people in Gary, Indiana. And how much does that have to go into Sur that same problem? Surprisingly, like uh, back in that time, the, uh, the local governments, including Gary, and the city of Chicago, the city of Chicago got rid of its, its thing. They were very uh, active and in the forefront of the environmental field. And that when the EPA was created, it shifted the direction. Now the federal government is leading the issue. Chicago's environmental group and Gary's were in the forefront of, in the early 60s, of air pollution control technology and, and strategies and so forth. So they did have that. Now, they, uh, you lose the political will to keep that. And the first, second part of your question, I'm, I'm getting old. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no problem. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, does it only matter, though, when it is, like, highly educated, wealthy white people that these things affect? Because obviously, no, like, no, I no. mean, something like, no. you know, Flint, Michigan, right, for example, or, like, other situations um, where... No, it affects all of us. It's, there's, no way, there's no around, way around it. In the area of air pollution, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, because of the air currents that are created by Lake Michigan, Hyde Park, which has no industry, was have the highest air pollution problem for particulates because the, the, the material would come off of Northwest Indiana, go out into the lake and come back and come hit right into Gary, I mean the Hyde Park. So they had the highest uh, I used to deal with the air pollution uh, monitoring, and I was always shocked that this area right off the point would have the highest uh, particulate amount, i.e. the worst air. So it affects everybody, and you can't get around it. Yes? Do I have a strategy for maintaining hope? Uh, I'm almost resigned that in this immediate area, uh, uh, arena, that if we don't manifest some actual pushback, that it's going to go for a while and get worse. Uh, so, but, but I'm an optimistic person. I believe that it can turn around, and I'm hoping that in November that there'll be some signal that people are really sick of, of these, these uh, assaults on uh, collective behavior. 
Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, you can do one more question. Oh, cool. Um, really glad to hear you were an alum. So right now, like 60% of U Chicago undergrad is like UConn, basically oh, oriented, God. capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sometimes I, well, often I feel like I'm in a very privileged position because I'm with all these like bad guys to me, I guess. Um, what, what can I do? I just don't know what to do with that position, like with the fact that I'm with these people that are going to go and become the, the bankers that may not make environmental decisions in the future, what can I like Did you ask, these people are asking some questions that they really don't know what I would ask, tell them to do. Uh, <laughs> but but the, 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 uh, the fact that you say you're in philosophy is that we have a real serious problem with people not knowing how to think. And so they can't process a lot of good information that's presented to them. And, and philosophy is that, is teaching you how to think. Uh, U of C, which I have, have some issues with because of its, uh, we I'll talk about community, its effect on, on the community. I have a real problem, but the problem was manifest because you going to U of C taught me how to think. So I can see what they were doing to this community, where when I was living in it, I didn't know, I didn't have a clue. So people can, with your field, and I believe that we should really have some more public outlets for discourse on thinking, on how to think, and definitely put it into the schools, uh, so that people can really uh, learn how to process the information that's put in, for, in front of them. Uh, econ majors, I, I remember this so well, 1980, UFC changed. That's when it shifted, because remember, when I was there, it was the, the main field, everybody wanted to go was into physics, you know, it was, all, it was a real science-oriented school, and then Reagan comes in office, and then all of a sudden, it's now all about the business school. And they have led the way in this country and controlled this mindset that money is God. So I have, I have some problems with this school in that regard. Sweet. Uh, I'm gonna wait for that question um, until we close it. Um, but I've been, of course, waiting for the art talk. Okay. That, that definitely is um, a big connection to so many people uh, from the South Side and so many communities that I feel like I'm a part of and have been brought up in uh, for a really long time. And uh, so this entire time that you are an environmentalist and a scientist and all of these things, uh, you are also an art collector. Um, and I think from an early age, you spoke to your father who was an artist. Um, I was curious as to what got you interested in and uh, how did that love or passion uh, for the arts and then furthermore art collecting uh, start? Well, I was born on 63rd Street in a two-room apartment. And my father was a frustrated artist. And he was an artist and photographer and furniture maker and all kinds of stuff. He was a Renaissance man. And so we had art in this two rooms everywhere. And, so, and I was born at home, so I was born into it. <laughs> this, is the, this is the world that I grew up as a toddler. I was underneath the easels and so forth. And so I've always been around art. And, I wanted to replicate my father in the early years. I wanted to be an artist because I did have a little talent and so forth. Uh, but I told you that after getting in high school, I shift shifted and went off on this science trip. But I've always maintained a love for art, always. When I was at U of C, my roommate was an art major. I'm studying chemistry. Usually they, you know, they hook the science people together. I had an art major as my, my uh, roommate. And I had always uh, in the room cut out things from the m magazines and put on the wall. But you know, that's just because I always wanted to have images because that's what I grew up with. But he came back to the room one day with a lithograph that he had made in class. And 
being a scientist, I said, I know what lithos means, I know what graph means. You're writing with stone, but I don't know how you did it. So he explained the lithographic process. And I said, oh, this is really cool. And then I asked him if he was selling it. And he said, yeah, I'll sell it. And so we negotiated and came up with the astronomical sum of $10, <laughs> which is a lot of money in 1968. And I had put that piece, that was the very first piece that I acquired. And I've always had it. In fact, if you come to my house, it's in on the wall right at the door. So as soon as you come in, it's, it's a, it could be the first thing you see. All right. Now, that was the first piece I bought. And then, like I said, the world changed. In 68, 69, the world changed. And all of a sudden, we, want, we are entering a world where black power, where black identification, no longer are we consent to be called Negroes is that we now are in a whole nother mindset and, a, and one that is going to be pushed further by the arts itself, is that art now became, at that time, you had to have art for social purposes, the Black Panther Party, so forth. Everybody was pushing art to say something, to speak to the political issues of the day. So I was in that too. So I was acquiring art from uh, the Afro-Cobra period, you know, people, and so forth. And what is this period called? This is, uh, this is the beginning of the black arts movement in the early 70s. And Afrocopa was a group that formed here in Chicago of uh, artists that came together and came up with their own aesthetic and a manifesto. And then they, they carried out. Now, 50 years later, the country is now recognizing that that was some really special stuff. And there's, there's memorial, I mean, uh, celebrations going on all over the country about Afrocobra, something that started right here in this neighborhood, uh, along with the uh, mural movement uh, that uh, uh, started with the Wall of Respect. Again, something that came right out of Bronzeville, where people responding to the pressures decide to do something and they create a community mural. A whole lot of cultural activities were surrounded by it, and then that triggers activity all over the country. Everybody started emulating what started here in Chicago, and then it went all the way across the world. So we, we've been a place where, and that was a time where there was a lot of artistic creativity going on here in Chicago. And uh, I was right there in the middle of it, but kind of not as a art maker, but just sort of a participant. You know how you go, you hang with your friends and they take you somewhere. So I'm in the environment as a scientist, but I'm enjoying it and I'm every now and then I'd acquire some work. I kept doing that. And then when I got the job with the EPA and I actually had some money, I would just buy artwork because I like it. I, because I'd already started to learn the, the scene, the art scene. So I was acquiring work, acquiring work. And people would tell me, oh, you're an art collector. And I would say, no. No, I'm acquiring art. Got a lot of it. And I'm saying, no. I'm, and I did that. I resisted the term for almost 30 years. It was around 2000 that I finally had an epiphany and recognized that, yes, I am an art collector. I've got like five, six hundred pieces of art. You're an art collector, right. okay? Right. <laughs> but then it made me question, why was I resisting the term? Why did I not want to be identified as an art collector, even though that's the act that I was doing? And t t uh, turning it over my head, comparing different aspects of the culture, I came up with that we tend to think immediately when you say art collector that the person is super wealthy. Everything mm. supports that concept. The recent uh, New York Times saying uh, one piece sold for $200 million. Uh, Puffy bought uh, Kerry James, James Marshalls for $21.2 million. Is that it reinforces that this thing is for the super wealthy. That you, average person, you're not in this. You don't have the kind of money to be able to do that. So we have this concept that art is very, very expensive and that it is for the wealthy. The second thing that I had in my head was that I'd seen these art collections, 
are collectors and they squirrel away this art and keep it to themselves and they're very, very private and concerned with security and you can't see what I have. I have to die first before you get to see what I have. And that's not who I am. I'm a very social sharing and, and, and open person. So I had this privacy concept that I attached to the term art collector that I didn't have. The third thing, and I'm a scientist, is I hear everywhere, and I even believed it myself, that you had to know something about art. You had to know something. You had to be academic. You had to be encyclopedic with, the, with, with art. You had to know every artist that has ever walked the earth. You know? And I believed that. And I'm thinking, I've never taken even art history classes and so forth. So I'm, I'm, I can't be an art collector. The fourth thing is like what she was talking about is that what has happened in our minds is that art has been linked to economic investment. That you are somehow every transaction has something to do with value in the future. That you, you know that this piece is going to or it will become more, more valuable and so forth. And that's not why I was buying art. So I had four strikes in my head that were keeping me from thinking of myself as an art collector. Now the epiphany came when I started thinking about other aspects of the culture. And the one that pops up first is music. You know, you got, the culture's got art, the visual arts, the musical arts, dance, theater, literature, poetry, fashion, so forth, all of these different aspects of, of the culture. And I thought about music and I said, okay, everybody, is a music collector in some way, shape, or form. They, they take it very serious. People, people collect. Every, now, you don't collect the same thing, but every, some, some way, shape, or form, you are involved in the music culture and you are a collector of it. You acquire it in some way, shape, or fashion. And the first thing you do in your music collection is you want to share it to the point you will take your earbud out and put it in somebody else's ear, say, listen to this, you know? And so I said, okay, here, you don't have to be wealthy. You, you clearly share this thing. And you don't have to know a thing about music to like it and to acquire it. You don't have to know how to read it. You don't know how to sing. You don't have to know how to play any instruments and so forth. So and you don't think of it in terms of investment. So I'm like, okay, these things that I'm believing associated with the art culture doesn't exist in these other parts of the culture. So what is it happening? Why is it egalitarian bottom up in these other areas of the culture and it's top down with the visual arts? Amazing. Yeah. All right. And so you spoke a lot to um, these, these groups or these institutions. You mentioned Afro-Cobra um, or, you know, many, many of which my mom, Dorian Sylvain, who's an awesome fine artist and, and muralist, uh, taught me a lot about growing up, uh, which is that, you know, Chicago was a hotbed of these black creative institutions um, from, you know, Afro-Cobra to Sapphire and Crystals or AACM or uh, ETA Theater, you know, or, or Month 2 Dance Group. Um, why from that point then, I think, do you take all of these ideas and want to formulate it into some sort of another institution or organization? Um, if I'm not mistaken, you started Diaspora Rhythms in about 2003. Is yes, this correct? How much of the mission or, or drive do you feel like? Comes out of being in Chicago? Mm -hmm. Oh, all of it. Is that Chicago is a place where if you grow, grew up in it during the 60s, you're going to be an activist in whatever field you fall in. You're going to be serious about it. And I know from in the African American community, everybody that came up during that time period is in the forefront of something. I'm now uh, in the forefront of pushing art collecting. I don't know if I'm, other commu communities in the city could easily be, but it was an area, a, a, a time when 
people felt energized to do things and feel that in the collective, we can accomplish something, we can bring about change. And that's why I'm kind of chastising people that they're not, they're not doing that today. And as a result, we're getting walked over. Uh, I, falling in the tradition of all of the, these artists and art groups that came out of Chicago in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, I uh, immediately, once I had that epiphany, recognized that oh, we have to change that. We have to change that mindset in people. It was that that is blocking our cultures, that the visual arts culture. As long as people believe these things that are not true, we can't. So I formed an organization, uh, and that our mission is to promote art collecting in our community, to dispel those myths and get people to recognize it's OK to say, I like that. And that's all you have to do. Because that's all we do with music, is that you hear something, you say, oh, I like that. So that's what we have to do with the visual arts. It's not complicated. And that, yes, you're going to like something. This other person will like something different. But that is OK. It's OK. And when I look at the music culture of America, music culture of African Americans, music culture of Chicago, the fact that people have just done that simple thing of I like it has made all of those things super important, internationally recognized. So we can make a change, just like the change of, of coal to natural gas. It's a, it can be a real incremental small thing, but when you add it up, it's major. It's a major activity. So I'm believing that we should all engage in the visual arts culture and just get things that you like. And that as a result, it's going to pop, it's going to bubble up that some really phenomenal things are going to come out of that. Um, I have over 1,300 pieces in my house. And <laughs> how, how do me and Steven get in your collection? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, what I'm seeing is that if I open my house all the time. I had a class there yesterday from the School of Art and Institute. Is that they see the effect. They feel it of going, coming in there and seeing these artists and their work. Uh, and they did not, because like at the School of Art Institute, the artists that are in my collection are not talked about. They're not taught. So, but they're seeing the power of that. And I'm, and I'm saying, OK, we really can make a change. But just by doing these little simple things, just incrementally sm small changes in our lives, and we can bring about a big, big change. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure in your collection, I mean, I was recently at the Smart Museum and saw um, the Time Is Now exhibit. Mm -hmm. I'm, museums aren't already at you for a lot of that work, and, or like in time to come, definitely will be to a lot of extent. OK. OK. Today. Three pieces left my collection and are going to Miami for Art Basel. Uh, at the DuSable and the Margaret Burroughs show, there are six pieces out of my collection. And then Diasporisms has a show in the bottom section of the DuSable, and I have eight pieces in that. And that I'm get, now getting more and more requests for art to uh, be sh going to museums for shows you know, on loan. I'm not giving it to them. And I want it back. Uh, but that's going to, and I expect that's going to be even more as, as the time goes past. Because what we have done in this little simple task of just picking out what you like, time passes, and then all of a sudden, that has significance as a historical act. That you, just like Afro-Cobra and the Wall of Respect, all of a sudden, that's major. Everybody's writing books about it. And, all these people do is they got, came together and painted a wall in a neighborhood. So these small things become really big over time. So it's, it's, uh, it's going to happen more. More and more people are going to ask, museums and institutions are going to be asking me for the work that I have in my collection. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a perfect um, segue for another big question that I think about in relation to you all the time is, um, there's this new fancy millennial word, which is uh, an influencer, right? And I think for a really long time, 
you have been a cultural influencer and uh, you have been an educator and you have been a mentor uh, to so many, many people. Um, a lot of which, right, that you probably were some of the first people that collected their art or, you know, were always open and flexible with your time and energy. Um, so a question that I definitely, definitely wanted to ask you, um, looking at you as a person that I would, you know, uh, parallel to like a Dr. Margaret Burroughs, right? Or like, you know, for real though. Oh, yeah. um, like in terms okay. of legacy, like what, yeah. what are some of those things that okay. you hope to You, you hit it right lead? on the head. Yeah. Is that this is something that is passed on. And you mentioned Dr. Margaret Burroughs. When I was a little kid, 12, 13 years old, I was taken to Dr. Margaret Burroughs' house. And she had a museum, the Ebony Museum. This is in the early 60s. She had the Ebony Museum in her house. And she would let people in, and she would take, baby, go on downstairs and look at that art. And so mm -hmm. I was exposed to this, of seeing somebody having this in their house as a museum. All right, and then as you, anybody that's been around her knew that that was a constant uh, maxim that she would say, what is your legacy going to be? So she was constantly setting up all of us to replicate this con the, what she has done and what she got from somebody else. Uh, so it's to pass this on to other people and keep putting it out for each generation. And I'm, I'm interested right now in trying to find young people to come into our organizations with the intent that they are going to take it over and take it into the future. And one of the things that has tickled me is a little historical fact that most people don't know, and I'm going to share with you, is that most people know that this city was founded by a black man, right? The city reluctantly in 2006 acknowledged that he actually did found the city, Jean Baptiste Pont du Sable. And he was a Haitian. He came from Haiti and came up in the 1760s from Haiti through New Orleans up the Mississippi River into this area. And it was a wilderness. And the Native Americans were predominant. This was New France at the time, in the 17, early 1760s and, and, and 70s. And he came into this area, and he was a fur trader. And he got cool with the Indians, because that, that's how we are. And, you know, we <laughs> get in there. cool with the Native Americans and was accepted into the tribe and eventually married one, with the daughter of one of the chiefs. But uh, the, 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 the nation that was to the north of Chicago was the Potawatomi, and the nation to the south was the Illini. And guess what? Chicago, the area where we're in, was the battleground. Nobody settled here because this is where they fought. So this was a sort of like area you didn't want to be in. Is that, and so he was fur trading in this area. And eventually, like I said, he married into the, 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 the chief. And they were, the two nations were getting ready to fight another war. And he negotiated a peace. He's the Ralph Bunch of that time period for those old heads <laughs> <laughs> that know about Ralph Bunch going to, to Israel. Uh, he negotiated a peace. And the chief asked him, what did he want? And he asked for this. He asked for the Chicago area, at the confluence of the, of the, of the, the north and south branch of the, of, the, of the river and so forth. And he set up his settlement there. It thrived. It grew, so forth. Same time, on the east coast, the United States is being formed. And now they start to expand west. This part of the country became the Northwest Territory. And they started coming into this Northwest Territory. And here's this French-speaking man, black. They ain't feeling him. And so they gave him a lot of static. And to the point that he eventually left the city in 1800, sold all his stuff and the rights to the land, and left. The deed in 1800 lists everything he owned all the way down to the number of nails and chickens and pigs and hammers and so forth. And guess what else is in that deed? 
He had an art collection. He had 23 paintings, and I am baffled by that, is that with no roads in the 17, late 1700s, there's no roads, no trains, nothing like that. How do you end up having 23 paintings? I mean, everything would be difficult task to bring in. So, and then also that you are so cultured in a wilderness, in the boondocks, to have that, and more than likely, his house would have to have been the spot for everybody to come to, hey, because you got some art on the wall. Uh, so, <laughs> so I am just, just fascinated by that this city, because I'm an art collector and formed an organization of art collectors, the founder of this city was an art collector. And guess what we did in 2005? We inducted him into our organization. He's the first collector. Mm. Legendary. Awesome story. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. I definitely, I don't, where, where did you even find that information? I read. You just read? Okay. <laughs> that'll, that'll do it. <laughs> that'll do it. Um, wow. That's, that's super, super awesome. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I appreciate everybody sliding tonight. We definitely are here and posted and going to hang out for a little bit. But if anyone had any questions that they wanted to ask, probably would try and close this part of the evening and uh, yeah, open it up a little bit. Jasmine? I'm a visual arts student at University sure. of Chicago. Oh, I'm cool. getting my MFA in visual arts. And so I'm just curious, um, how do you think your collection is kind of uh, changing the conversation, but also opening up the canon of like visual arts? I think there's I, I don't know, sometimes I feel like there's the prestige that you speak of sometimes that is like not, because in the past people weren't right, or art historians weren't writing about the Afro Cobra group or the mural movement, that sometimes they're kind of undermined as not being um, part of like this elitist part. institution. So how do you think your okay. collection is? I, I gotta start out saying I have a serious prejudice against art schools. Wrong. <laughs> I really think they do more damage than, than good. Uh, and that they foster this top-down uh, elitist concept. And they foster a language that is incomprehensible to the average person. Uh, in fact, I have gone to many, many shows and look at the text on the wall and I'm struggling, and then I remember, I went to the University of Chicago. We had to read some of the most complex things, and I don't understand what this says. So it's some, it's some that they're doing some real damage to, to our concepts of, of appreciating of the visual art. Uh, to open up the canon, I've gotten way past that. I don't care. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And they'll catch up with me. Because what you just asked me, the museums are coming. I didn't go to them. They're coming to me. And, that, uh, and, I, I, and I think that's what all founders have that concept. I don't care that it's not working right now or that people are not paying attention to it. We're going here. So. To answer your question, I'm really not that concerned. I, I, uh, I find that the, there's too much of the conversation about art that is wrapped up in this art school language that just blocks people from uh, even appreciating so that when they come to my house and they see this, they're stunned at the beginning because they don't know what to say. Uh, they're, they're shocked that there's so much here that they don't know anything about. And it's actually grabbing them and, gra and grabbing their attention. So it's, it's, uh, it's disconcerting. Just a follow up, are there any like, um, up and coming movements or works that you're really into right now being made by um, visual artists of color that um, maybe isn't, you know, Margaret Rose is a good example. So I'm not saying that Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just curious, anything, is there anything you're collecting or really interested in? 
I don't approach it that way, but um, I'm seeing a, a turn from this conceptual abstract expressionist concept that, that everything is conceptual and that you don't, the object is not important. I'm seeing a turn and that they're gonna be coming back into representation, form, figure, and so forth. I hope that they come back with a concept of excellence in the craft. Because a lot of stuff, I, I, I just call it like I see it, a lot of it is really junk. It is not well done. It's not a lot of thought done in. It's just some thrown together stuff. Is that I, I listen and I look. I'm looking at the piece and listen to what you're saying. It ain't making no sense. <laughs> but Chicago is on to some, and there's a lot of young black artists here that oh. are like fire. Like I oh, mean, yeah. Desmond, oh, yeah. like you can't be shiny, right? Hebrew. I mean, there's a bunch of people that are like Zakia. All these people are like really inspired and take a lot of heed from a lot of the things that have happened before um, because we had, you know what I'm saying, elders that always pointed us in the right direction and put us on to what it was. And so um, mm -hmm. I'm super excited too because oh, yeah. Chicago's really a hotbed for a lot of stuff going on right now. Um, so I, I appreciate you raising that and definitely down to talk to anybody about who my favorite. Well, I'm, I'm going to, I have a lot of favorites and, and, uh, and I'm always interested in looking at what young people are doing. In fact, I was out on the north side yesterday with, to see this younger artist's work, just to see it. And then I was on the, on the internet this morning looking at Brittany. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm looking at the young people's work, uh, but I'm also gonna challenge them, do they look at the older work? Do they, it's that, are, you, are you looking at what came before you? Uh, we, it's, it's not just starting today, I mean, and, and, and that you are in some traditions and you might not know it. You need to, to pay some attention to that. Yeah, shout out to Tempest Hazel and like 60 Inches from the Center oh, yeah. and like, you know, people that are trying to make that a little bit more accessible. Because I think oftentimes, yeah, it is hard. I mean, unless you like in an institution in which you got a bunch of archives and a bunch of books that you can carve through. I mean, most of the stuff that I think we probably see is like, straight to the internet and the, the hottest thing that's in the explore page or something sometimes so um right and yet there are things like actual institutions with doors and they have shows in them and you have to go and see up front see it re in real term look in fact i i'm people ask me about the the obama pictures the portraits and i said i'm holding re judgment i have to stand in front of it and look at it is that looking at it on the screen is not the real thing. And, and Patrick stayed down the street and also leads an organization in which you can do home tours of awesome work in other people's homes. So, hey, it's definitely out here. It's, it's, it's accessible. Yes, that's true. Cool, you got one more question? Hi, sir. Um, I was thinking about the environmental issues and um, the art and how to like bridge them. I wanted to know, um, um, my first question was, do you know some artists who um, re you know, use um, recycled stuff and they make a point of trying to um, use material in a way that help the environment when okay. they make their art and I also would like to know if your father did any of that. No, no I doubt he did that. Uh, of uh, reusing, no. I, I think he would, he would struggle to acquire canvases and so forth. He might have painted over some canvases, but I don't think that. Now, to answer your first question, that's always been. Artists have always recycled stuff. That is not something that just comes up now. And there are tons of artists that do that as, part, as their practice and they actually say it, that this is what I'm doing. But they always have done that. Can you give us some names? Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, oh, tons of <laughs> Joyce Owens, Julian Williams, Dalton Brown, uh, Juarez Hawkins, this, this, uh, tons. They are. The creative mind is a very inventive mind. It's a mind that is constantly looking at things. 
uh, uh, Garland Taylor, he, he finds things on the street. All, they, they're constantly telling me I found, and I have pieces which are made from things like that, uh, that they, they found. Uh, Dale Washington would make uh, art pieces out of almost anything. Is that if he, he, he I have a, a, a portrait of him as the artist, and he created the assemblage using only art equipment. So it's brushes and quills and so forth, and he's put them all together and painted, and that's his face. But you can see it. But it's all made from recycled with, with uh, materials. Uh, so they, they, they do that. That is very common. That is not an unusual thing, nor a new thing. Um, well, when you go to the art museums, you find out there's usually two or three paintings underneath the one that you're looking at. Shout out to Massager Washington, also Dale's son, who's making some super, super cool stuff. Yes, and I think is soon to be in this space with us too sometime. So yeah, yeah right. shout out to Massager. Matthew? Patrick, do you have any questions for Kahari? Mm -hmm. No, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I had a whole bunch. I had a bunch of them. Because uh, I, I really wanted a, a conversation that's intergenerational. Uh, I'm really concerned of how young people are thinking and approaching things. One of the things that we wanted to have in, in this conversation, because there really was a very uh, big idea to cover all three of these subjects. But the one I wanted to talk about was community. And I grew up in a community of Woodlawn in Bronzeville and so forth. And when you asked me earlier about community, I recognized after I molded over that we didn't think about it. We were in one, but we didn't think about it, that we were in a community. We were in a very vibrant community and everything was working and so forth. Now people think of community as kind of like neighborhoods and property as opposed to how we function with the community was a whole set of, of, uh, of people interacting with each other, businesses interacting with each other, entertainment places and so forth. That was a community and a world that you lived in and you, everything was there. Now we talk about a community, oh, this community is gentrifying, uh, these properties are now being rehabbed and so forth. It isn't that people are interacting with each other. In fact, you might move in the neighborhood and nobody ever speak to you. So the question was, back to you, is, is about how you, you the, this millennial generation, how you think of community. Because uh, you speak about them all the time. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the community, at least from my experience of of being from a place where I was connected to other generations of people, um, you know, growing up on a block where there was a block club that three generations of people knew each other. So I think I always had that community as well as I always, due to interest or the internet, had community based in interest. You know what I mean? There's there's people in the room that I know from being interested in skateboarding, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or being interested in organizing, or like, you know, and you, and you find those worlds and create community or build community uh, that way, very intentionally, you know, and you know. Um, so, I mean, also. And the, a device is assisting in that, 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 that activity, not proximity. Is that right. we had a community and I knew everybody on the block because that's as far as we could go. <laughs> so, but you're saying with this device, now you can find with intention people of like mind or yeah. a like passion. Yeah, but I mean also, I mean a lot is attributed to, you know, people like Connie Spring who make sure that places like this exist to have community. You know, I mean, it was, it was a very huge thing for me to be able to pop into Blackstone Bicycle Works because it was kind of already thought of that, you know, there's a lack of this in a lot of ways. And so um, coming there to be able to then meet people and find other, you know, other ways and it'd be a jump off point to finding other things um, has to be also a very intentional thing in terms of how we make spaces 
for other people to come into and then help to channel that into something else too. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it can't all be just uh, just internet or just, uh, yeah, not a physical place. So um, shout out to all the people that have been doing that work for a really long time. It's super, super important and so many people benefit from it. Cause you know, we all, I mean, we all trying to make friends. We all, you know, uh, are trying to figure it out. And oftentimes I've felt it is way easier when you have other people helping you to do it. No, that's definitely true. It is easier when we uh, work together, but I'm not certain about that everybody is on that page. I mean, just being realistic, that there's some people that are just, as your young generation, they call them haters. Yeah, they just really are haters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, Big time. Is, like, but I'm sure that's not new to this time. I'm sure it was people <laughs> in the 60s like, oh, man, look at this fro, man. This man. <laughs> Like, so yeah, that's not new to this, but only thing I can say is you just gotta also hope that that attracts that community, right? I think there's a lot of people that uh, are just leaders in that way, and I mean, there's a lot of people I've been graced in, even meeting you, right? You know what I'm saying? People, every, people were telling me like, oh man, I love Patrick, like everybody has to be more like Patrick. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's building a community, because it's like you have a whole you know, group of people because of the way you move in the world, that now are a fan of that and see that and then will go on to okay. do the same things, right? Exactly. And so I think that's a, that's a super radical way of community building in a lot of ways um, that mm -hmm. people see and gravitate towards. You, you say radical and I'm gonna say it's not that radical. It's actually uh, an old form that we just emulate. You learn from your elders and you emulate the good qualities that they have or the good practices and so forth. Uh, I, I clearly am emulating Margaret Burroughs because I had the experience. I lived, you know, partially with her, you know, during her time. I saw what she did. And so I'm, I'm trying to do that same thing. And I want somebody to see what I'm doing and do something similar. Yeah, best believe when I left your house, I was 5% more <laughs> Patrick McCoy. Easily. <laughs> Easily. So cool, yeah. I, I do really appreciate everybody coming out um, tonight. It was was super sweet, super special, and I love Patrick so much. And, and may we all walk out a little bit more like Patrick. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good job, good job. Sweet. Um, so I think Matthew was maybe going to open up the building or if you had any questions um, about organizations in specific, um, Matthew Searle, uh, who is huge curator of this space. And also this is a part of a series in which there's one more evening. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic to you. So just quickly before we all go separate ways, if you haven't signed in here, please do just so we have a record of everybody that was here tonight. If you sign up for our mailing list, you'll hear about more opportunities. It won't be as good as it was tonight, but it'll be pretty good. Um, we have these brochures which have sort of the outlines this whole project. We've been working with William Hill, who's just a few blocks down the street, and sort of honoring his presence in the neighborhood, learning from him, inviting artists to create projects at his indoor and outdoor sites and here at the building. We have one more event, which is gonna be Stranger. Um, it's, going, it's called uh, the Chainsaw, Chainsaw Lowering and public tasting. And basically, we're gonna go and break bread in the big room. There's gonna be some strange sounds and music and smells. Um, and we're going to make room for new artists and ideas in this building. Um, one thought that I wanted to share with you is that you came, you all came tonight because of Patrick and Kahari. You might not, you, you may not have come because of Experimental Station, but I want, to help make this a place that breeds uh, moments like this and get more people in the building dreaming about what can take place here and have more of a sense of ownership. So I'm glad you came for them and I want to do right by you all by continuing to create um, 
special moments like this. So this brochure sort of outlines all the projects in a two block radius in the neighborhood. It has the date for the final event, so please grab one of these. I'm happy to give a tour of the building, happy to answer any questions. I have cards here, please sign up for the mailing list. Thanks so much for coming out. Please drink more beer and wine and have a good night. <laughs>